Glory to Jesus Christ. You are listening to the voice of reason. On today's episode, I'm going to be bombarded by the hardest and most difficult questions ever asked by mankind by these very intelligent youngsters. They are teenagers that go to schools that I've never heard of, so I know they're very smart. And uh, I'm ready. So let us begin. I am in the hot seat. You are listening to the voice of reason. Who wants to start? Who has a question? So my question is, is purgatory biblical and why do we believe that your sins can be forgiven in purgatory? Excellent question. Is purgatory biblical and why do we believe that our sins can be forgiven in purgatory? The answer is yes. Purgatory is 100% biblical and let me explain why. Let me first start off by explaining what purgatory is. Purgatory is the post-mortem sanctification process that must be completed before you enter heaven. All of you are okay. All of you know that uh, God sanctifies us, right? Our whole lives, God is sanctifying us and purifying us. Well, that process has to be completed before you enter heaven because the Bible tells us in Revelation 21, 27 that nothing that is unclean can enter heaven. And purgatory is biblical. It is mentioned explicitly by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 to 15. So please, if you will, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and read for us verses 11 to 15. And, and if you'd like to, you can even uh, read it into the microphone and that way everybody can hear it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 to 15. Which verses? 11 to 15. 11 to 15? Yes. For no other foundation can any one lay that than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any one builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man, <coughs> man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but, though, but only as through fire. But only as through fire. So what St. Paul the Apostle is explaining here he says that when you have the foundation of Jesus Christ, the foundation of Christ is what saves you. We are saved by Christ. But he says, after you have the foundation, you have to build upon the foundation. And Paul says that you can either build upon that foundation with gold, silver, or precious jewels, or you can build upon that foundation with wood, hay, and straw. And he says that on the day of judgment, that's when you die and you meet God, the work that you did will be tested by fire. And what does fire do to gold, silver, and precious jewels? That's how it's purified, right? But it doesn't perish in the fire. But what does fire do to wood, hay, and straw? Burn it, it burns it up. It destroys it. So if you have anything on top of the foundation of Jesus Christ, at the moment of your death, when you're judged, whatever you have on there that shouldn't, shouldn't be on the foundation, uh, that fire, which is metaphorical in the way that the Apostle Paul is using it, will burn it up. And it says, you will be saved, but only as through fire. Revelation chapter 3, turn to Revelation chapter 3, also talks about this in verse 18. I believe it's verse 18 to 22. Revelation 3, 18 to 22. You're at the very front of your Bible, and Revelation is at the very end of your Bible. So you're going to need to do some more flipping. Gonna look at the at, at the, it's at the very end, sister. It's at the very end. Okay. Very end. <laughs> Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 18. It's like 18 and 19. How far? Oh, it's the next one. There we go. Okay, chapter 3, verse... 18. 18, thank you. We need the microphone. Um. 
Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may be rich and white garments to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen and slave to anoint your eyes, salve to anoint your eyes, that you may see. So it says that you have to buy gold that it may be refined by fire and uh, the inspired author of Revelation is saying that this right here is your white garment. And the white garment is what allows you to enter heaven. Uh, we, had, uh, the, we have the parable in the Gospel of Matthew, where uh, Matthew 22, is it? 23? Where uh, Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast, a wedding banquet, and that uh, the servants of the king go out and they invite people from all over the place to come into the wedding, uh, to the wedding feast, right? And the king notices someone that is in there that isn't wearing a wedding garment. And if you're not wearing your wedding garment, what happens to you? Well, what does Jesus say in the parable? Uh, the person that snuck in, that wasn't wearing the wedding garment, he had to be bound up and he had to be tossed outside of the banquet. And he said that this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. So you have to have your, your uh, white garment, which is what you receive uh, when you are baptized. And then on top of that foundation, uh, whatever you uh, built upon that foundation will be tested by fire and it will either be refined or it will be burnt up. Whatever is burnt up is what we call purgatory. And the word purgatory is a Latin word which just means something that purifies. It's purgation. It purifies you. So if we all are in agreement that Jesus Christ purifies us, then we should have no problem whatsoever with purgatory because purgatory is a purification process that we all have to endure uh, before we enter heaven. And it's important to understand that the sins that we pay for, because you asked the question, is it possible for us to be able to pay for sins, like even after, like in the next life? Well, the Bible tells us that it is. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to go to verse, I believe it's 26. And these are the words of our Lord Jesus. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 26, We're going to read one second. So you're going to, we're going to start in verse 21, 21 through 26. If somebody could read it into the microphone, please. Matthew 5, 21 through 26. What does Jesus have to say to us? Uh, verse 21 through 26. Verses 21 through 26 of Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that, that it was said to the men of old, You shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, shall be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go, first to be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Make friends quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out till you have paid the last penny. Truly I say to you, you will never get out till you have paid the last penny. So what we read here is that in context, Jesus is talking about salvation. He's talking about hell because he explicitly mentions there, he says that if you uh, have something against your brother, if you've offended your brother, you are liable to the judgment of hell. And he says that you can be uh, uh, accused, right? And that you can be put in prison. And he says you can't get out until you've paid the last penny. Well, when Jesus says that part, that you can't get out until you pay the last penny, is he talking about hell? Because can you get out of hell? So we know that once you're in hell, you can't get out. So if Jesus is saying that you can be put in prison, but that you can get out, it, you know, you have to pay the last penny. We know he's not talking about hell. He's talking about something else. And that something else that he's uh, talking about, uh, we don't have to turn to it now, but in Matthew chapter 12, uh, Jesus says something similar where he says that uh, there are sins. Um, maybe we should turn it. Go to Matthew chapter 12 where Jesus, uh, he's talking about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And he says that uh, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a sin that cannot be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. So when Jesus says the age to come, he's talking about, um, uh, about heaven. He's talking about specifically 
But when Jesus returns and we all have the new heaven and, and the new earth and the, and the final judgment, the age to come usually refers to the final judgment. Jesus is saying that there are sins that can be forgiven in the age to come. And that's in Matthew chapter 12. Um, so Jesus himself tells us that there are sins that can be forgiven um, at your judgment itself. And Paul tells us again in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, when the, the day of judgment comes, when you die and you meet the Lord, your uh, uh, work will be uh, tested with fire. So it's important to understand that what purgatory is, is a removal of the temporal guilt for sins that have already been forgiven. You need to understand that purgatory isn't a second chance. Purgatory isn't like a middle place between heaven and hell that you go there and you got one more chance. You know, you didn't do too well while you were alive here on earth, so you're going to get one more chance in purgatory and then maybe you can make it. That's not what it is. Purgatory, as St. Paul uh, described it in 1 Corinthians 3, is only for those that already have the foundation of Christ. If you don't have the foundation of Christ, purgatory isn't for you. You go to hell because Christ saves. So you have to have the foundation of Christ first and then purgatory if you've built with wood, wood, hay, and straw. Um, but it's for temporal guilt. Temporal guilt is just uh, guilt that is in time. Because the Bible also teaches that even after we're saved, God will still chastise us. Right? The Bible actually tells us, for example, like in the book of Hebrews uh, and in the book of Revelation, it tells us that God, even after he saves us, we are his children, we become his children in baptism, God will actually still punish us. God will actually still punish us. And it says that he chastises those that are his children because he is a good parent, right? And imagine a parent that never chastises or punishes or disciplines their children. Would that be a good parent? No. When you mess up, it doesn't mean that you stop being the child of your parent. But your parent has the obligation, the moral obligation, to discipline you when you mess up. And that discipline that you receive is called temporal punishment. Now, there's a really big example of temporal punishment. Because there are some people that will say, ah, there is no such thing as temporal punishment. There's only eternal punishment, right? Well, there's eternal and temporal punishment. Can anybody give me an example of what temporal punishment is? Does anybody have a... Uh, uh, there's one really big one that we all, that we will all have to endure. Temporal punishment. All of us have to endure this one thing that is a temporal punishment. Um, is it like sin or is it like just like general suffering? Death. Death. Death is temporal. Because the Bible teaches us, right, in John chapter 3, for example, um, all over the gospel that uh, when you're in communion with Jesus Christ, you live forever. You live forever, for all of eternity. And you say, well, wait a second. There have been billions of people now in the last 2,000 years that have uh, been in communion with Jesus Christ, and they've all died. Every single one of them have died. But Jesus, I thought you said that we're going to live forever. Well, Jesus wasn't lying. Jesus didn't get it wrong. Uh, living forever um, in the internal sense, but death itself is still a temporal effect of sin. When you go to Genesis chapter 1, uh, God tells Adam and Eve, he says, when you eat of the fruit of the tree, he says, if you eat of the fruit of the tree, on the day that you eat of it, you'll die. That's what Genesis, uh, not Genesis 1, Genesis 2 says, on the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree, you'll die. But Adam and Eve did eat from the fruit of the tree, but did they die immediately? No, they did. They died spiritually. Because when you sin, when you commit a mortal sin, uh, you're, you're, you know what mortal sin is, is that uh, mortal sin completely cuts you off from life-giving grace, right? It completely cuts you off from Jesus Christ. So they did die immediately, right? But their physical death, that's something that was only a temporal effect of sin, and that came later. So, death dying physically is only a temporal effect of sin. That's why you can be in a full state of grace, you can go to confession, receive the Eucharist, live a sacramental life, never sin, and still die. Because that's a temporal effect. There are other temporal effects of sin, like for example, let's say that you have, your sin is uh, drunkenness. Let's say you're a drunkard, right? What is the temporal effects of the sin of, of drunkenness? You're a drunkard, you know it's a sin, but you go to confession, 
and you're sincere in your repentance. You don't want to be a drunkard anymore and God forgives you. But a temporal effect of that sin is that now your liver is completely destroyed. That's a temporal effect of sin. The temporal cuts, and again, te the word temporal just means in time. Consequences that you suffer in time. That's what purgatory takes care of as well. Okay? So the eternal consequence is hell. The eternal reward is heaven. But there are consequences and, reward and rewards within time. And uh, purgatory is where you get your... Uh, uh, temporal consequences uh, taken care of, whether it be a reward or whether it be a, uh, um, a punishment. And it's, a, it's important to understand that purgatory isn't a place. Purgatory is a process. And even the language that the Apostle Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 3, it can be understood as metaphorical. And the languages that our Lord uses in Matthew chapter 5 can also be understood as metaphorical. In the West, we have the image of fire. Uh, in the East, we have uh, the way that Eastern Christians explain it is they call it toll booths. When you go to heaven, right, you're saved. You have Jesus Christ. You have your foundation. When you go to heaven, you have to pay a toll. That's what Jesus uh, alludes to in Matthew chapter 5. It's uh, toll booths in the East. It's uh, fire um, in the West. And both of those images are in the Bible, right? In 1 Corinthians 3, Revelation 3, and in Matthew chapter 5. You either, either the fire purifies you or you got to cough up some, some coins, uh, on your way to heaven. It's a metaphor. Purgatory isn't an actual uh, temporal place. Um, it is outside of space and time, and um, it's only for those that are saved. Purgatory isn't for, the, for those that are damned. Hell is for the damned. Um, purgatory is um, Jesus' love, finishing your purification before you get to be with him in the beatific vision. Go ahead. Any questions? Yeah. Say it again. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you have another question, go ahead. Let's ask. So how does praying for the dead fit in with all of that since you're being punished in purgatory or taking care of your temporal punishment? Then how does other people praying for you help? That is an excellent question. Yes. You know that we are all called to pray for each other, right? If you read uh, 2, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, it says that we all have to pray for one another. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that we are all uh, one body and that the body can never be uh, separate, right? We are all individual members or parts of the one body of Jesus Christ. And Paul uh, in 1 Corinthians tells us um, that the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no use for you. Or the hand can't say to the foot, I have no use for you. Because we are all uh, essential members of the one body of Christ, right? Well, there isn't one body of Christ on earth and then a separate body of Christ in heaven, and then like a third body of Christ that's going, in the, that's like a in between going through the purgatory process before they go to before they go to heaven, right? We're all one body of Christ, and what that means is that we have to pray for one another. What that means is that the saints, the members of the body of Christ who are already in heaven with God, can pray for all of the other members of the body of Christ that are not yet in heaven, and the saints that are on earth can pray for those that have passed away that have not yet uh, entered into the beatific vision. And you can pray for one another because the Bible tells us so. And uh, just like the Bible says that you can actually pray for each other's salvation, right? You can pray for each other's salvation. You can pray for each other's sanctification. No one has any object, uh, any, uh, 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 no one makes any uh, objections to that, to the idea of us being able to pray for each other's sanctification. That means that we can pray for the sanctification of those souls that have passed away but have not yet entered the beatific vision. So it is an act of charity. It is uh, an act of love to pray for the dead. So all of your loved ones that have passed away, pray for their souls. Pray for them every single day. It's a good, pious, uh, healthy thing, which the Bible tells us in 2 Maccabees chapter 12. 2 Maccabees chapter 12 says that uh, the Maccabeans, um, they, had, uh, they were uh, uh, warriors, in, during the Maccabean War, um, they had some fallen comrades. And uh, it says that they prayed for them after they had died. And the Bible says that it is a holy and pious thing to pray for those that have died. Because if they died in Christ, if they died in the righteousness of God, they're still part of this body, they're still part of the church. And you can still uh, pray for them because the Bible also tells us that death cannot separate us, from, uh, does not separate us from each other. So even if some of us have died, we're still not separate. We're still part of the one body of Christ. 
And that's the beauty of, of Christianity, is that even those who have passed away, we have a very real uh, metaphysical connection with them, not just the uh, memories of them. We can actually uh, do things here in this life that can affect uh, their uh, salvation. If you have loved ones that have passed away and you're, you're not sure where they are, you're not sure, you can pray for them every single day for the rest of your life. Pray for your loved ones that have passed away because God is outside of space and time. And God, to God, every single moment is present to Him all in one moment, right? So what that means is that for all we know, for all I know, the only reason that I'm, that I'm here standing in front of you guys, the only reason that I went to confession this morning and then received the Eucharist is because maybe somebody, you know, a hundred years from now was going to be praying really, really, really hard for voice of reason. And because God saw those prayers, God, because he's outside of space and time, knew that somebody a hundred years from now was going to be praying really hard for me. God applied those prayers to me today. And the reason that, I have, uh, uh, that I'm cooperating with God's grace is because of uh, the prayers of others. And it could even be prayers that have happened in the future. It could also be prayers that have happened in the past. Right? So you can pray for people that have passed away. You can even pray for like the future. For your lineage, for your bloodline, for whoever. Pray for the world. Pray for, you know, you can pray outside of space and time. Because God is outside of space and time. That's the beauty of the mystery of the Christian faith. Um, so the Bible says that we all pray for one another. The Bible says that uh, the body of Christ cannot be separated. And uh, the body of Christ says that we, uh, the Bible says that the body of Christ prays for one another. So that's those that are in heaven, pray for those that are on earth. Those that are on earth can pray for those that um, have passed away, that they be in heaven. We're getting close to celebrating All Saints Day here on November 1st. What is, the, before November 1st, what do we celebrate? The night before, what do we celebrate? Halloween. What does Halloween mean? It means holy evening. What does evening mean? Evening means night, means night before. That's what the word evening means. It means night before. So the night before, the holy day, which is All Saints Day, where we venerate all of the saints that are in heaven, the night before, we pray for those that have passed on. We pray for them the night before. That we, The next day when we go to Mass, when we go to the liturgy, and we uh, uh, worship God um, because we prayed for our loved ones the night before. Uh, our hope is that they be in heaven too, so that when we venerate the saints, you're venerating your loved ones as well that are there in heaven. Any other questions? Go ahead. Hello, hello. Let's go ahead and come around here, you guys, so we can sit over here, okay? So earlier when you were talking about, I believe it was, you said it was in Matthew, mm -hmm. you said that this the sin of something to do with the Holy Spirit was unforgivable, mm -hmm. but I thought Jesus was all forgiving. Yes, so Jesus says that there is one sin that cannot be forgiven, and that's called the blasphemy, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> let's go ahead and let the people settle, settle in. Give me one sec. Okay. So, the question that you asked is that in, uh, Matthew, cha in Matthew chapter 12, uh, Jesus talks about the, uh, this is in Matthew 12, this is actually in Matthew 20, 21, where he talks about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that there is a sin that can't be forgiven, and that sin is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And you said, wait a second, I thought that Jesus forgives all sins. Well, Jesus does forgive all sins. But then why does he point out this one specific sin called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? And why can't that sin be forgiven? What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Well, this is, uh, takes us back to the Trinity. We know that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? We come to the Father through who? Jesus. Through the Son. We come to the Father through the Son. How do we come to the Son, though? Through... Through the Holy Spirit. We come to the Son through the Holy Spirit, and then we come to the Father through the Son. That's the monarchical hierarchy of the, of the Godhead, of the Holy Trinity, right? So if you want Jesus to, uh, to, um, 
forgive you your sins. He'll forgive you all of your sins. But in order to come to Jesus, you need the Holy Spirit. You can't come to Jesus without the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible is clear in Romans that the Holy Spirit actually calls us, calls us. God himself calls us to his Son. The Holy Spirit calls us to the Son. And then the Son uh, uh, forgives us, right? The Father forgives us through the Son. But in order to get to Jesus, you need to have the Holy Spirit. So what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a complete rejection of the Holy Spirit. If you reject the Holy Spirit, and what rejecting the Holy Spirit is, is when you completely reject the grace that God has given you. Because we know, the Bible tells us in, in uh, is it 2 Timothy? It's 2 Timothy. That it is the desire of God for all men to be saved. God desires every single creature to be saved. So what that means is that the Holy Spirit will work in all creatures to bring them to the Son. And if you don't make it to the Son, it's because you blasphemed the Holy Spirit and you rejected the grace of the Holy Spirit to bring you to Christ. So um, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit means that you, just reje you outright rejected God completely and you don't know if you've committed this, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit until you're like on your deathbed and you know you're about to die and at the very end, final impenitence, you know you're about to die and you say, nope, I want nothing to do with God, even on your deathbed. When you know you're about to die and you're, you know, God at the very last moment of your life reaches out to you and says, I can save you, I love you, I can save you and you say, nope, and you slap God's hand away, that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And that's the one sin that obviously can be forgiven because the Father forgives through the Son, but we can only get to the Son if we have the Holy Spirit. Any questions about that? Any other questions you guys have? If you do, we'll pass the mic. So this is being filmed for YouTube, guys. Um, if you have a question, go ahead and pass. Or do you have a question? Yes. Okay, you ask a question, and then we'll, we'll have your question. Uh, okay, go ahead. Why do we call priests fathers when in Matthew 23, verse 9, it says, Don't call anyone earth father. Excellent. I love that question. I've done so many videos about that question. Why do we call priest father when Jesus himself te tells us in Matthew chapter 23 verse 9 to call no man father? Everyone always brings up Matthew chapter 23 verse 9 where Jesus says that, but no one ever brings up Romans chapter 4 uh, where um, Paul, the apostle Paul, calls Abra Abraham the father of all Christians 16 times in Romans chapter 4. They also failed to bring up uh, in the epistles of John, in 1 John, where John addresses himself, calls himself a father, and then the people that he's, the church that he's addressing, he calls them, the priests there, he calls them fathers. And also, Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, says, uh, was it to the Corinthians or was it to the Romans? In one of his epistles, he says that, I, yeah, in the Corinthians, he says, I am a father to you, in the gospel and then in his epistles to Timothy he says to Timothy I am your father and you are my son in the gospel so all over in the Bible we have the apostles John uh, and, pa and uh, Paul calling themselves father and addressing other men as fathers so what does that mean does that mean that the Bible contradicts itself does that mean that uh, Paul and John were not listening to Jesus because they call themselves, oh, and also in Acts, uh, is it Acts uh, 6, when um, the first martyr, Stephen, when he's martyred, uh, he calls, he also calls Abraham his father. So he says, our, he calls Abraham our father, the father of Jews and Christians. So did Stephen disobey Jesus right before he was martyred? No. When Jesus says, call no man father, he also said, call no man master. He also said, call no man teacher, right? But we have no problem calling other people teacher. We have no other, uh, problem calling other people uh, master. And master actually means, master and teacher actually mean the same thing, right? Um, have you, has, have, has anyone here ever called, like when you go to school, do you ever uh, address your male professors as mister? The word mister comes from the word master. Mister and master means the same thing. So when you call somebody mister, you're calling them master. And the Bible also says call nobody master. But here's the, the funny thing too. Paul, all over in his writings, he refers to great masters of the faith and he refers to great teachers of the faith. 
So Paul, he's guilty of all three. He calls people father, he calls people teacher, he calls people master, even calls himself father, calls himself teacher. So you say, okay, does that mean that the Bible contradicts itself? Do the writings of Paul and John contradict uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 9? No, it doesn't. Because we know that Jesus often spoke in a hyperbolic sense. He used hyperbole because Jesus also said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. He also said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. When was the last time you saw a really devout Christian wearing an eye patch? When was the last time you saw a really devout Christian that uh, was missing you know, his hand or her hand or her foot, right? It's a hyperbolic language. And when you read it in context, Jesus is clearly saying, call nobody on earth father, for you have one father in heaven. So when Jesus says this, he's referring to the heavenly father, the father of all creation. He's referring to God. And obviously, when Paul called himself father, when John called himself father, or when they called other people father, they're not referring to themselves as God. They're not referring to the other fathers as God. They're referring to themselves and to others as spiritual fathers. They're not God, but they represent God. They are the ministers of God. So you can call them Father. So again, when you read the Bible in isolation and you only pick out one verse and you ignore the rest of, of, of Scripture, um, you end up just uh, coming to conclusions that you can't come to because you need to take the whole thing in context. So yes, we can call uh, our spiritual uh, leaders Father because the apostles call themselves fathers. The apostles were all fathers. They were all priests. And that's what we call priests and deacons as well. In the Eastern tradition, deacons are also called father. Um, is, that, is that good? Does that answer the question? Cool. Any other questions you guys might have? Go ahead and speak into the microphone. You know what? Actually, I promised that he would be next. Can you give the microphone to him? Then we'll come to you, okay? Him, and then my friend next to him, and then you, I promise, okay? So, can I ask any question? You can ask any question. Just ask. Speak into the mic, okay? okay. Even in your, in your YouTube channel, right? About yeah, yeah, yeah. Just hold it up and you can ask any question, my friend. Okay. So yeah. I saw your YouTube channel and I do like it. Okay. So there's this one video about mm -hmm. the Pope. Mm -hmm. And you said not to slander the Pope like, Tim, uh, like Dr. Um, Taylor Marshall. Right. And <clears throat> I, well, in opinion, I disagree. Because, I mean, I, I did understand that the Pope did some stuff like all these canon laws, I think you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the reason why uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall, uh, one of the videos that I saw was criticizing the Pope mm -hmm. about the pagan Pachamama that mm -hmm. he took in right. the Vatican Garden mm -hmm. and lit incense. Right. And has a kind of a memorial over it in which mm -hmm. he should not accept any pagan god in mm -hmm. the Vatican, the holy place too. Right, right. Also, there's other things like Pope Francis took four years to excommunicate, excommunicate four girl deacons. Mm -hmm. Also, Pope Francis has, uh, I, hope, I hope they removed it, but has a picture, a painting of a girl from the Amazons breastfeeding a dog and a child, mm -hmm. which is also <clears throat> kind of bad to have in a church. Mm -hmm. And I can name other few, but those are the three main ones that I want to like show. Like, hey, you gotta sometimes just call out the Pope. Don't do that. Tell the other people this is not right. Okay. I mean, there's. I mean, I know Dr. Taylor Marshall can be like, we need the Latin right this and that. But I mean, I'm just getting more into like the, what the Pope did wrong. What Pope Francis done? Yeah. Okay, so you want me to address those three? Yeah. Okay, you said that Pope Francis took four years to excommunicate female deacons. The Catholic Church took four uh, took four years to excommunicate Martin Luther. Martin Luther was first in trouble in 1517, and he wasn't uh, excommunicated until 1521. So the Catholic Church was, took four years to excommunicate Martin Luther, and the reason that the Catholic Church takes a while to excommunicate people is because we have to remember that the Church is our mother. And a good mother, right, excommunicate, kicking you out of the house, saying, hey, you can't stay in my house anymore, that is a last resort that the Church will take only after every other option has been exhausted, right? And um, Pope Francis, with anybody, because Pope Francis does not like excommunications because Pope Francis is very afraid of, uh, of another major schism happening in the West, like with the German bishops. Pope Francis, and I think Pope Francis has to do it. I think Pope Francis just needs to excommunicate the, the Catholic Church in Germany because those <laughs> bishops are, it's clear that they're not going to, uh, 
obey him. So I think he should excommunicate them. But uh, when you read church history, you see that popes, whenever they have to excommunicate somebody, it's always, they always wait. It's always a really long process. Sometimes it takes years because, you know, for example, with Martin Luther, they gave him, an enti- they gave him a trial. They gave him a trial, the Diet of Worms, and they said, come on, work with us, Martin Luther. We're, we, we don't want to excommunicate you. We don't want to do this. But the church will if you have to. So if the Pope takes a while to excommunicate somebody, it's because there's a canonical process that has to take place first before an excommunication is finally, uh, uh, is finally ratified. Um, as far as the Pachamama incident, that right there is one of the most uh, overrated uh, nothing incidents that people like Taylor Marshall and Taylor Marshall, um, Taylor Marshall is hurting the church more than he's helping the church. More people leave the Catholic Church because of Taylor Marshall than come into the Catholic Church. There are so many Eastern Orthodox that are Eastern Orthodox because of Taylor Marshall. And let me tell you about the Pachamama incident. You can go back and you can watch the video. And especially if you speak Spanish, it's easy because it's done in Spanish. When they present the statue of the Pachamama to Pope Francis, what did they call it? Did they call it the Pachamama? Yeah. No, they didn't. They didn't call it the Pachamama. They took this statue, right, that's part of, the, uh, of that culture, right, uh, of Amazonian culture. They presented it to Pope Francis and they said, this Pope Francis is Our Lady of the Amazon. There is a patronage of Our Lady in the Amazon. And they said they wanted an image for Our Lady of the Amazon. And they took an image that already existed for them that is not a religious image. The Pachamama statue is not a religious image for the people of the Amazon. The Pachamama has never been worshipped. How are you doing? Okay. Let's, that's fine. Um, the Pachamama, the Pachamama, hey Jonathan, maybe you want to stand over here for when people come in and you can t- direct them to, yeah, just right here. The Pachamama, a lot of people don't know this, the Pachamama has, was, is not worshipped by people of the Amazon. The Amazonians have no uh, cult of Pachamama in the Amazon. The Pachamama was later on worshipped by people of the Andes far away from the Amazon. So the Amazonian Catholics there, uh, this statue that they use, they have no, uh, it's not a religious statue for them. It's a placeholder that they uh, uh, gifted to the Pope and they said, this is not God, this is a, a, a depiction of Mary. This is Our Lady of the Amazon. And go back and watch that ceremony that took place at the Vatican. That's what it is explicitly called. But you know what though? Even when, even though it was clear that they weren't uh, intending to worship Pachamama because Amazonians have never and do not worship Pachamama, right? And even if they did, we're not talking about pagans here, we're talking about Catholics, right? Um, When they handed the statue, right, when they presented the statue to Pope Francis, Pope Francis' face was like visibly like, oh, this isn't a good idea because Pope Francis knew like this is going to be because of that statue is depicted, uh, that statue, the Pachamama is depicted as like a naked woman. And he's like, it's not a good idea to, to uh, depict Mary in this way. But he let the ceremony, but the ceremony go on because it was part of the piety of the, of the Amazons. And we have to understand that in some cultures, um, there are some um, images that to us, to our culture, it might scandalize us. But to them, it's not scandalous. And vice versa, there are things that we do here in, in the developed world, in, in Western culture, that also scandalizes people of other cultures as well. So you have to be culturally sensitive and you have to uh, uh, think, you know, uh, where did this come from? Where did this happen? What was the meaning? And again, go back and watch the video. They did not call it the Pachamama. They called it Our Lady of the Amazon. You can say that it's not a good idea to have Our Lady depicted, you know, uh, nude, and I would agree with you, for us, me as a Westerner, that totally offends my sensitivities as a Westerner, but to the Amazonians, it doesn't, to them, they don't see that as a big deal. Um, what they would see as a big deal, though, is for us to accuse them of being pagan idol worshippers, because, again, the Amazonians, uh, there is no cult of Pachamama in the Amazon, it is in the Andes, not in the Amazon. And these are devout Catholics, and they were doing it as a... Um, uh, to show their piety, and they wanted uh, Francis, Pope Francis, to um, declare Our Lady of the Amazon as the patron for, of the Amazon, and that's exactly what happened. Um, what I think that they should do is that the Vatican should commission a brand new uh, 
icon image statue of Our Lady of the Amazon that isn't the Pachamama, the Pachamama statue. So again, the statue was never called Pachamama and uh, it wasn't worshipped. If you want to say, if you want to say that Pope Francis and everyone in the Vatican and all of those Amazonian Catholics, if you want to say that they were worshipping Pachamama, if you want to say that, you also have to say that all Catholics in every single Catholic church worship Mary when they bow before an image of Mary. But we know that Catholics, don't, we, we know that we don't worship Mary, right? You have to be consistent in your logic. You have to be consistent in your thinking. If, you, if you're bowing to a Pachamama statue is worship, just because you're bowing, you know, lighting incense, then bowing to, uh, to that image of Mary, bowing to any image of any uh, saint and lighting incense is also an act of worship. But again, we know that's not true. So we would afford ourselves uh, the charity of, of having that distinction and that nuance. We need to afford other Christians, because we have to remember that these Amazonians are Christians, they're Catholics. We have to afford them with that same charity. And we all need to stop listening to Taylor Marshall, because Taylor Marshall is garbage. Don't listen to Taylor Marshall. I promise you, if you keep listening to Taylor Marshall, you're going to leave the Catholic Church. You want to know how I know that? Because I listened to Taylor Marshall for years, and I almost left the Catholic Church. I almost became Eastern Orthodox because of him. And not only that, everything that Taylor Marshall says, most of what he says, um, is proven false. Immediately, he'll, he'll make a video, and then there's all these other YouTubers that will prove him wrong. Um, and Taylor Marshall, I don't, honestly, I don't even think you can call Taylor Marshall Catholic, because Taylor Marshall, uh, Taylor Marshall says that he rejects Vatican II. If you reject that any council of the Catholic Church, you are not Catholic. Taylor Marshall is, uh, uh, sub, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, he is materially, Taylor Marshall is materially a schismatic because he uh, ex rejects Vatican II. And you can't reject a single ecumenical council of the Catholic Church. And Taylor Marshall is going to say, well, Vatican II didn't teach, um, didn't, doesn't have any canons or anathemas. Uh, there are many councils in the history of the Catholic Church that don't have canons or anathemas. So if his argument is that we can reject Vatican II because it didn't uh, teach anything definitively, it has no canons or anathemas, well then that means that you can reject um, the Council of um, uh, Lateran I, for example. Lateran I doesn't have any canons or anathemas. A lot of the councils of the, of the um, 13th centuries, of the 14th and 15th centuries, uh, 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries, don't have canons or anathemas either. So he is being inconsistent. And also, if you want to be a faithful Catholic, you have to follow canon law. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Canon law teaches us that uh, whenever we criticize the Pope, uh, we, have to, uh, we have to, as Catholics, criticize the Pope with the judgment of charity. Canon law also tells us that when we um, criticize teachings of the Pope, or when we... Uh, um, have teachings of the Pope, when we interpret the teachings of the Pope, as a Catholic, you are bound by canon law to interpret the teachings of the Pope um, in a hermeneutic that is continuous with all uh, Catholic teaching for the last 2,000 years. So if you want to say that Pope Francis teaches something that, uh, that he has ruptured uh, Catholic teaching, if you want to say that Pope Francis is a heretic, if you want to say that Pope Francis is harming souls, if you want to uh, criticize the Pope to that extent and that extreme, you need to know that you are violating the canons of the Catholic Church. Canon 212 tells us that we can voice our concerns, and I think you should voice your concern because there are concerns um, with this papacy that are valid concerns. There are things that you can critique, but Canon 212 says that when you do so, you have to give the Pope what's called a filial respect. You have to come to the Pope as a son or a daughter, and when you criticize the Pope, you have to do so in a way that is respectful, and slander and mis slandering the Pope, misrepresenting the Pope, saying that the Pope is teaching things that he does not teach, saying that the Pope um, has a, uh, what do they call it, a program of undermining Catholic doctrine, saying that Pope Francis is trying to undermine the Catholic Church, that is in violation of the canons because you are not giving him the judgment of charity. Not only do we have to give the judgment of charity to the Pope, uh, we have to give the judgment of charity to all people, to all bishops, to all priests, to all deacons, and to each other. So if we are all owed, we all owe 
each other the judgment of charity, we even more so owe Pope Francis the judgment of charity because that's what it means to be Catholic. Do you have anything you want to say to that? Um, there's a lot to me. Yeah. I just have one just question. I just yeah, go ahead, absolutely. Just one last one. And then the guy next to you. And I just got me puzzled. What did yeah. the Pope mean by gay marriage blessing? But I, I don't think the Pope literally said priests can make, bless this. But I'm so glad you asked this I'm question. I'm curious about this. You guys know what he's talking about? Have you guys been seeing the news uh, lately? Recently, news came out saying that Pope Francis said that uh, priests can now bless same-sex unions. That same-sex couples that are, have like a civil quote-unquote marriage, that uh, all priests are now allowed to bless uh, same-sex unions. No, that is not what Pope Francis said. What Pope Francis said in his response to, uh, to uh, a dubia that was submitted to him about this question, Pope Francis said that you can bless anyone who is trying to live as a faithful, devout Christian, as a faithful, devout Catholic that wants to do better. If somebody comes to any priest and says, I am involved in a homosexual relationship, or I, have a, I live a homosexual lifestyle, but I don't want to do it anymore, please bless me, bless me that I be able to live according to the gospel, that I be able to cooperate with the, uh, with the grace that God has given me, give me a blessing that I be able to do that, Pope Francis says, yeah, of course, you can give a blessing. And you know what? When Pope Francis said that, he isn't saying anything new, because what do we see every single week uh, at every Mass, at any liturgy? We have a whole line of people that go up uh, for communion, right? We'll have people that go up and they'll receive the Eucharist, but there are some people that will bow their heads and they'll receive a blessing. And the reason that they don't receive the Eucharist is because they know they can't receive the Eucharist because they are not predisposed to receive the Eucharist because they are in a state, they are not in a state of grace to receive the Eucharist. But if somebody comes up to a priest and bows his head and asks for a blessing, when is the last time that you ever said, uh, saw a priest say, Oh, you want me to bless you, sinner? You want me to, to bless you? You obviously know that you can't even receive and you still have the audacity to come up to me to receive a blessing. No, I'm not going to bless you. Go away. No, a priest doesn't do that. Priests can bless sinners. Blessing a sinner is a different thing than blessing sin because Pope Francis already came out and said that... Uh, the Vatican, the church, any priest cannot bless sin. Can't bless sin. Also, uh, because this is related, let's get the Amoris Laetitia business out of the way as well. Pope Francis released a papal encyclical in 2016 called Amoris Laetitia, where people like Taylor Marshall and people that uh, are honestly, um, I'm just going to say it, they're dishonest. They're very, very dishonest. They were accusing Pope Francis of saying that people that uh, are divorced and then civilly remarried uh, can go up to communion and that they can just be given communion just like that and that it's no big deal. That is not what Amoris Laetitia says. Amoris Laetitia does not say that. What Amoris Laetitia says is that if there is any person that finds his, uh, himself or herself in a, uh, being civilly remarried after having been uh, divorced, uh, having, being sacramentally married, and then leaving your, 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 part, your, your spouse and then being civilly remarried. What Pope Francis said is that if you find yourself in that situation, but you are practicing continence, meaning that you're not sleeping with the person that you're really not married to, right? If you're in a situation where you are technically legal, legally civilly married, um, but you are not living as, as husband and wife, uh, those people can be admitted to what? Confession. Confession. Amoris Laetitia does not say that you can start giving uh, the Eucharist to anybody that's in a, in a civil, uh, that is civilly married, right? Whether you're uh, divorced and then civilly married, or if you're just <coughs> civilly married and you never were married sacramentally, um, both of those are, 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 you can't do either, right? Pope Francis says that if you find yourself in that situation, um, but you're, you're practicing continence, you can be admitted to the sacrament of confession. And every time in Amoris Laetitia uh, that uh, uh, Pope Francis mentions people being admitted to the sacraments, he never says the Eucharist by itself. Every single time, 100% of the time, he says confession first. If you're in a civil union and you know that you're not sacramentally married or that you're committing adultery, Pope Francis says, if you know this, 
and you're convicted and you're sorry and you don't want to, uh, uh, you don't want to be living a sinful life, you can go to confession. Is he saying anything new? No. That's what confession is for. Confession is for those that are sinners that go and ask to have their sins forgiven with the intention of not sinning again. That's what uh, the sacrament is for. So again, actually read what Pope Francis has put out. Read the clarifications that Cardinal Fernandez has been putting out in the last month. And by the way, there's a really popular web website called LifeSite News. Are you familiar with LifeSite News? Don't, don't follow LifeSite News because they're trash. They're garbage. Let me tell you why, okay? Let me tell you why. Um, Cardinal Fernandez gave them an interview on September 30th where Cardinal Fernandez is the guy that's in charge of the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith. And he's the one that like clarifies when people have questions. He's the one who's in charge of clarifying if there's confusion. He gave them an interview on September 30th, right? Uh, just a, a little over a month ago, clarifying what the Pope said about blessing, quote-unquote, same-sex unions, right? He clarified, LifeSite News did the interview, they had the interview, and they didn't release it until three days ago. They released it three days ago. They, they sat on it for, almost, for, for three weeks, but you know what they did in between that time? They interviewed him on September 30th, and then on October 6th, they ran a whole bunch of stories on their website. Pope Francis said that we can bless, that priests can bless same-sex unions. Pope Francis didn't say that, and they had already talked to Cardinal Fernandez, who set them straight, and they decided to not publish that interview, and they came out and they slandered the Pope. They lied about Pope Francis, and then they didn't release the Cardinal Fernandez uh, interview until just a couple of days ago, even though they've had it since September 30th. So they knew, they had the interview, they knew Pope Cardinal Fernandez, who has the authority to clarify what the Pope has taught, that's, that's why Pope Francis gave him the job, they completely ignored him, and they came out and they slandered the Pope. So LifeSite News is trash. I used to subscribe to them. I unsubscribed to them because they, they, they are Pope slanders. They're Pope blamers, right? That's what they do. Um, they are the ones, Taylor Marshall, LifeSite News, um, the other guy with the beard that I can't stand, the Canadian dude, he's garbage too. Um, all he wants to do is just, uh, uh, what's the, his name isn't important, he's a nobody. Um, Jordan Peterson? No, 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 no. Jordan Peterson isn't Catholic. Um, the other Catholic dude, I don't, he, he's not important. Timothy Gordon? No, T Timothy Gordon, I like Timothy Gordon. He's, not him, he doesn't have a beard. Anyway, <laughs> <clears throat> um, they're garbage, and my, my advice to you, my, I'm an old man, okay? I'm an old man. I've, I've been through things. I've been studying this since I was probably your age. Since I was 14, I've been looking into this stuff. I promise you, um, Taylor Marshall, delete him. LifeSite News. LifeSite News used to be good. They used to like actually like um, do like good work. They used to like champion the pro-life cause. And now they care more about blaming Pope Francis for everything more than they actually care about doing what the work that they were founded to do. So delete them. They're garbage. Um, anybody that uh, blames Pope Francis for, that lies about Pope Francis, slanders Pope Francis, they're not Catholic. They're violating canon law. And they are the ones who are in danger of, uh, you know, if they're going up and they're receiving the Eucharist, they're the ones who are in danger. They're the ones who are in danger. And it goes for bishops. We've had some bishops that are doing the same thing. Bishops that have accused Pope Francis of teaching heresy, which he hasn't. And um, I challenge anybody, anybody to present to me one thing that Pope Francis has taught in his magisterium, or even one thing that he has just said as a private individual that is heresy. You can't do it. You want to know how I know that you can't do it? Because I tried to do it. And I couldn't do it. It's not there. How about and the, the cover-up of Bishop McCarrick? The cover-up of Bishop McCarrick. So uh, covering up Bishop... First of all, you can't prove that Francis was covering up um, Bishop McCarrick, right? Um, and let's say that Pope Francis was covering up Bishop McCarrick. And so you guys know, Bishop McCarrick was a bishop that was... Uh, he was an abuser. He was an abusive priest. And he uh, got caught. And uh, with the idea was that Bishop McCarrick was being protected by Pope Francis. Uh, and the idea of the story is that Pope Francis knew about it, Pope Francis covered it up, Pope Francis was protecting a pedophile, right? 
Well, first of all, that's not true. If you want to say that Pope Francis was protecting McCarrick, you have to say that Pope Benedict XVI was protecting McCarrick. You have to say that Pope John Paul II was protecting McCarrick because Cardinal McCarrick has been a cardinal since the pontificate of Pope John Paul II. And, you know, the thing is that, again, because the church is a mother, right, who cares for her children, even when there's somebody like a cardinal that does commits a heinous crime, right, what the church does is that the church looks into it, the church investigates it, and sometimes these investigations can... These investigations take a long time, and it's not, you know, because the church believes in your innocence until proven guilty. It isn't until the person is proven guilty that then the church will allow the civil authorities, will allow the, the law to, uh, to take its course, right? But again, your innocence until proven guilty. Cardinal McCarrick was proven guilty, and after he was proven guilty, that's when the church said, okay, Cardinal McCarrick, you are proven guilty. You have to be, uh, you know, you have to own, uh, own up to your crimes, and you have to be punished for them. But a lot of people were criticizing the church as a whole and criticizing the Pope because they want Pope Francis, they want everyone to immediately condemn people immediately. Well, that's not how it works. Remember, you're innocent until proven guilty. And first you have to be proven that you actually did something wrong before you can be condemned. And guess what? When Cardinal McCarrick was proven wrong, when it was proven that he really was a pedophile priest, that he was an abuser, the Catholic Church condemned him and said, but they gave him a fair trial, right? And it, let's say that Pope Francis was covering it up right? Let's even say that he was covering it up. What that would mean is that Pope Francis is just a bad pope. Covering up a, a priest that is not a good priest, that has nothing to do with his magisterium, that has nothing to do with his teachings on faith and morals, that has nothing to do with uh, the indefectibility of the Catholic Church. There have been evil people in the Catholic Church uh, since the time of, the, of Jesus and the apostles, right? Would you accuse Jesus, would you accuse Jesus of covering up for Judas? When Judas was taking the money, and, and, and Judas, we know what he was, he was uh, pocketing the money. He was the one that was in charge of the money, and he was pocketing the money. And then, you know, um, he sold Jesus out. Jesus knew about it. Jesus knew what, what Judas was doing, right? Are you going to accuse Jesus of covering up the scandal of Judas? Jesus knew what Judas, that Judas was going to betray him. Would you accuse Jesus of covering up for Judas? I don't think you would. So, again... Judgment of charity. It's what we're called to do as Catholics. Go ahead and give the microphone to my friend right here next to you. I, was, I give really long-winded responses, but it's important because um, these are important questions you guys are asking. Guys, you guys are asking. Ask your question, my friend. All right. So, yeah. we should only um, listen to the Bible. Tradition is not really that important unless it comes straight from the Bible. It says in Second Timothy, Timothy um, chapter 3, verse, what is this? 16. Oh, it's 15 in mine. 15 and 16. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know it, so. Yeah. Read it, bro. Read it so we can all hear it. Uh, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Amen. Now, what's your, now what's your question? <clears throat> um, so, we should, uh, like, should we just follow the Bible, or is all, like, tradition, is that okay? But y yes, because the Bible tells us to. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. What does it say? And if you guys have Bibles and you want to flip there, the question that he's asking is, should we, fi should we follow the Bible alone? Well, go ahead and read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15 and see what it says. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. There you go. So if, you, if you follow the Bible alone, it's impossible to, fi to follow the Bible alone because the Bible explicitly tells us to not follow the Bible alone. The Bible says to hold fast to the traditions that were passed down by the apostles, those that are, were either written or or those that were taught by word of mouth. And you know how it's really easy to prove this as well? Because when you think about it, when you look at the New Testament, which was written by the apostles, how many apostles were there? Twelve. Plus the apostle Paul, so thirteen, oh, yes. right? So of all of the apostles that wrote in the New Testament, right? So we have Matthew, we have John, we have Paul, we have Peter, we have James, and we have Jude. 
six. Where are the other seven? Did the other seven just not teach anything? Did the other seven just not... Are the teachings of the other seven apostles, are they not, are they not authoritative because they didn't write anything down? Absolutely not. All 13 of the apostles went out, established churches, and gave them the deposit of faith orally, but um, seven of them just didn't write anything down. Six of them did. And Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that you follow the writings of the apostles, even, if, even the, those teachings that were not written down. So yes, you follow scripture and tradition and the church because 2, Thess- uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 Right? 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us you follow scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 15 tells us you follow tradition. And 1 Timothy chapter 3.15 says that the church is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. So you have all three. You have scripture, you have tradition, and you have the church that Jesus Christ founded. Great question. Any, fo- any other questions? Any follow-up to that? Um, well, I was having a debate with a Protestant okay. just like a couple days ago. Right. Um, and when I, I brought up this verse... And he said, um, it, was, it was like, well, yeah, the traditions that are in the Bible are good. Like, I, I tried to bring up this verse, but he kind of threw it off. He said, the traditions in the Bible are good, but stuff like, let's say, praying to the dead mm-hmm. or like worshiping Mary, mm-hmm. stuff like that isn't in the Bible. Uh, so you're right. Praying to the dead isn't in the Bible. Worshiping Mary isn't in the Bible. And it's not in Catholic teaching either. Catholics don't pray to the dead. Catholics uh, ask the living for prayers. Um, remember what Jesus says. Uh, people that make that argument, they're like Pharisees. Because remember when the Pharisees went up to Jesus and they were like, uh, uh, they were like trying to test him. And what did Jesus say? He said, uh, God is the father of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of the living, not the dead. But Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived like a thousand years before, right? So what Jesus is saying is that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. They were not dead. So the saints aren't dead. The saints are alive, which is what the book of Romans tells us. And we don't worship Mary. We uh, venerate Mary. And we can venerate all members of the body of Christ because that's also in the book of Romans and in the book of 1 Corinthians. uh, And in 1 Corinthians, Uh, we venerate each other. Not only do we venerate the saints that are in heaven, we venerate each other. We venerate each other too. We venerate the saints that are on earth. So we venerate. We don't worship. Um... And uh, what else? Um, he says only what's in the Bible, right? Well, ask him, is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15 in the Bible? It is. And what does it say? Follow things that are outside of the Bible. So, sola scriptura, the, the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura, doesn't work because it's self-defeating, because it's not taught in the scriptura, and the scriptura actually says something else. It says follow tradition, and it says Follow the church. Um, so, there you go. Anything um, else? There is another thing. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a little difficult because most Protestants I know use a different um, translation of the Bible. Uh-huh. Many things are worded differently. So, if I was like to bring up uh, 2 Thessalonians um, 15, then it might be worded differently. It is in some um, Bibles. I'm pretty sure it was. When there, there are some Bibles that they... Uh, trans- there are some Protestant Bibles that translate the word traditions as teachings because they don't like the word tradition tradition that's too catholic that's too orthodox we don't like that protestants don't like that so they mistranslate the word in greek isn't there's a word for teachings and there's a word for traditions the word in greek is the word traditions it's not the word teachings but some protestant bibles mistranslate it as teachings and and if you ever come across a protestant and 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 you say flip to second timothy 2 15 and they read it and they read it as teachings you say oh uh, I don't want to b- burst your bubble, man, but I hope you know that your translation sucks. Uh, because that, the Greek word, that's not the Greek word for teachings, it's the Greek word for traditions. I'm just going to let you know that, and then you can do with that what you will. And then you say, I suggest you get the RSV, because that's far superior to whatever little rinky-dink translation that you have. Um, anyway, great questions. Can we, you had a question, right? Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and pass that to her. You guys are asking amazing questions. I love this. Let's do this every night. Um, why do only priests undergo an ontological change when there's no ontological difference between men and women? Why do priests undergo an ontological change when there is no ontological difference between man and woman? Yeah. I love that question. 
So uh, the question that I would have for you is, what is the ontological change that priests go through? And when do they go through that change? Um, like... So the, uh, there is uh, no ontological change that happens in a, uh, like when a man gets ordained to the priesthood, um, there is no uh, change in his ontology that is, um, uh, changes something that already pre-existed. Uh, something is added, a charism is added, and that is um, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, they share in the priesthood of Jesus Christ in a ministerial way, and they can um, administer the sacraments uh, because they're priests. So um, there is an ontological change in the sense that the Bible tells us that when you're a priest, you're a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So once a priest, always a priest. Um, but uh, men and women are different. The ontologies of men and women are different. Men and women have different roles. And, and the reason that God created us man and woman, right, is because men represent Jesus. Who do women represent? The church. The church. Women represent the church. That's why we call the church a she. We call the church a her. We call the church a mother. Because the church represents creation. It represents the new creation. The church is like the new Garden of Eden, right? Um, the church is feminine. Women represent the church because the church is the what? The bride of Jesus Christ. And men represent Jesus Christ. And priests represent Jesus Christ. Priests, celibate priests, they're celibate, they're celibate priests. They don't take a wife, but they're married. Oh, they're married. Who are priests married to? Priests are married to the church. the church. The church is the bride of the priest because the priest uh, represents Jesus Christ ministerially, right? And women, females, uh, you represent the church because think about this. Uh, man and, and woman, right? Husband and wife. When they come together, uh, they have babies, right? They create new life, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a gift from God. The man is the one who gives, right? The man gives to the woman and the life comes from the woman, right? Well, Jesus is the man who gave. He gave his life for his bride, the church, the woman. And through, through the church comes all of us. We are all children of our mother, the church, right? So uh, the man gives and the woman receives. Jesus Christ is a man who gave to the church, the church received him. A husband uh, gives to the woman, the woman receives and creates a new life. Men and women are different, but we're supposed to be because men and women complete each other, right? We complement each other, right? We all have, uh, men and women have their own respiratory systems. Men and women have their own, what are like all the systems in the body? You guys go to these fancy schools. There's the respiratory system. There's the, uh, what do you call the system of circulating blood? It's the, uh, the circulatory the, system. Yeah, it shows how smart I am, right? The circulatory system. Uh, I have a complete respiratory system, a complete circulatory system. I have a complete central nervous system. I have all these complete systems except for one. There's one system that I don't have completely. I only have half of a reproductive system. Half. And women only have half of a reproductive system. That's awkward. How are we supposed to reproduce? Well, men and women, husband and wife, come together. That reproductive system is completed and you get new life. So uh, there is a difference of ontology between men and women. That's why we call them men. That's why we call them women. And it's the same thing with the priesthood, right? Uh, priests are called to be the husbands of the church and women are called to be the brides of Jesus Christ. So women who go into, into, into the religious life and they become nuns, they are brides of Jesus Christ. So d if you're a woman, don't be mad that you can't be a, a, a priest. Why would you want to be a priest? You're a woman for the same reason that you, as a woman, you can't be a dad. We call priest father, right? If you were a woman and you became a priest, what, would you call you father? No, that makes no sense. Right? You don't want to marry yourself. You don't want to marry, no, you want to marry your husband. Women represent the church. 
The husband is Jesus Christ, men represent Jesus Christ, the bride is the church. Excellent question. Really good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Does anybody have any other questions? Go ahead. And, and if you guys are, if this is getting too long for you guys and you guys want to call it quits, you let me know, all right? <coughs> but I'm having fun. If you guys are having fun, let's keep having fun. So, um, so. when Lucifer chose to sin, mm -hmm. um, who tempted him? Like Satan tempts us, who tempted him to sin? Right. So, Lucifer, uh, Satan, right, the devil, is an angel, right? He's an angel that was created by God who then fell. Angels cannot be tempted. Do you know why? Because the only people that can be tempted are those who uh, do have a, a deficiency in intellect. A deficiency in intellect and will. Angels do not have deficiencies in intellect. Angels are created by God with a full intellect and full freedom of the will. Right? So God... He created all of the angels. All, there could be trillions and trillions and trillions, quartillions of angels, right? That God created. He created them all at the exact same time with full intellect and full conscience and full uh, freedom of will. So when he created them all at the same time, immediately upon their creation, they had to choose. At the moment of their creation, they already had all of the intellect and, and fullness of the will. They had to choose from the moment of their creation if they were going to obey God or they were not going to obey God. And those that decided not to obey God uh, are those that are fallen angels that we call demons. Satan being uh, one of them. So um, they weren't tempted. They, with their full consent of their will and their full intellect, they knew that if they disobeyed God, they were going to be separate from Him for all of eternity. So they didn't need to be tempted. They made an act of the will apart from temptation. So demons were not tempted. Demons chose. And demons are the ones that tempt us. Right? Um, so, yeah. Now you learn about angels. But for all the, the angels that are demons, we have all of the angels that chose to obey God. They had full knowledge, full intellect, full consent of the will, full free, freedom of the will. And they chose, I'm going to follow God. And thank God that there were angels that chose to follow God because we all have our guardian angels, right? We have the archangels, the seraphim, the cherubim, the, all of the nine choirs of angels, right? Heaven is going to be fun. When we get there, we have all these angels that are, heaven is going to be a blast. Heaven is going to be unlike anything you could ever even begin to imagine. Thank God for, for the angels. Does that answer your question? Yeah. They're good? Okay. Any other questions? Does anybody have any other questions? We can do doubles. We can, we can do doubles. You, you can get the mic multiple times. Let's just give the mic first to those who haven't asked questions yet. Go ahead, my friend. What's your question? Um, uh, if an atheist like, believes in a God, why should he become a Christian? If an atheist believes in God... So like, if he became... Mm -hmm. like, I'm saying like, if an atheist realized that there is a higher power, right. why would he make the leap from that to being a Christian? Excellent question. So here's how it works. When you're an atheist... You have a belief that there is no, maybe no higher power, right? Well, let's say that you, you know, you, through exercising your logic and reason, you come to the conclusion of there does have to be a higher power. Of course there has to be a higher power because only a higher power can explain all of the data that we have from the universe. Okay, there is a higher power. Now, what's the next step? You can believe that there is a generic God, right? That there is a generic God. So now the next step is this. Is that God a person? Is that God personal? What is the answer? Yeah. Is God personal? Yeah. Yes. How do we know that God is personal and I don't want the Bible? Atheists reject the Bible, so I don't want the Bible. How can an atheist come to the conclusion that God is personal? How? How do we know God? How do we know that God, not only that He is personal, He has to be personal. How do we know? How do we know that God has to be personal? That He isn't just like a generic, create. I create, but I don't care what you guys do to each other, right? I just created you, do whatever you want. How do we know that God is an, it's a person, that He's personal? How do we know? Nope, that's in the Bible. I don't want the Bible. I'm an atheist right now. I, don't, I reject the Bible. How do we know God is personal? How do you know, apart from any, I don't want any religious text, how do we know that God is personal? Are you ready? Here's how we know that God has to be personal. 
Who here, raise your hand if you believe in objective morality? Is there right and is there wrong? Is there right and is there wrong? Do atheists believe that there is objective morality, that there is right and there is wrong? If you believe that there is right and you believe that there is wrong, if you believe that there is good and you believe that there is evil, if an atheist can say that um, what's happening, for example, in Israel right now is evil, right? If an atheist can say that's evil. If an atheist can say that, um, uh, you know, here in this city, uh, people that uh, randomly attack, uh, shoot up random houses and kill children, kill babies, which happens a lot in this city, right? Shootings all over the city where innocent babies are shot in the head and they die. If an atheist can say that's evil, Guess what that atheist just admitted? God is personal. Because if God isn't a person, there's no such thing as objective good or objective evil. If God isn't personal, we can call whatever we want good. And we can call whatever we want evil. But we know that good and evil is objective. It's not subjective. There is good and there is evil. We can tell them apart. And the only reason we're able to do that is because we know God is personal. If we can do that, we know that God has to be personal. So that's how we know that God is personal. So now we get to the next step. Okay, we know God exists. We know God is personal. Now here's the next step. Are you ready? Has this personal God ever revealed itself in any way to like mankind? Has he? And then, now, now, when you start to ask that question, has the personal God, we know God has to exist, we know He has to be personal, has this personal God ever revealed itself to mankind? Now you look into religion, right? And now, when you look into religion, you have to uh, uh, make sure that whatever you, if any religion is going to be true, it has to affirm what we already know has to be true about the personal God, Right? How many religions are there in the world? Thousands. thousands. How can we sort through all of them? It's easy. Of the thousands of religions in the world, you can get rid of all of them except for three. There are only three religions in the world that can possibly be true. Only three. Of the thousands of religions of the world, only three can possibly be true. Which ones are they? Can anybody tell me? Um, um, Islam. Islam. Judaism. Judaism. Christianity. Why? Why only those three and no other religion? Tell me why. Because God came down in all of those, at least in some form, <clears throat> and He's more than just someone who watches everything. So and that. Like writings and yeah. So the reason that we know that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are the only three religions of the all the thousands of religions in the world that can be true. Those are the only three that could possibly be true is because they all affirm that there can only be one God and that that one God is outside of space and time, that that one God is personal and that there is nothing in the universe that is God. Every single other religion in the world will say that the elements are God, will say that something within the universe is God. And if that's what they teach, we know that they're wrong. Because we know that nothing within the universe, including the universe itself, can be God. How do we know that? Because we know that there was a starting point to time and space itself. And we know that um, there was a time before time and space, so to speak. And that time before time and space, before the universe began, before the Big Bang, before the, the expansion of the universe... We know that there was a, a time, it's kind of hard to, 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 talk, to call it time because time is part of the universe too. There is something other outside and uh, not temporal to the universe. And that thing that is outside of the universe is what we call God. And the only religions in the world that affirm that, and we know that that's true, our philosophy gets us that far, we know that that's true. Like that's not up for dispute. There's only three religions that affirm that. And that's Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So what that means is that those are the only three that could possibly be true, but they could all be wrong. Or maybe one of them could be right. Or maybe all three of them are right. I don't, who knows? You have to look into each of them yourself. 
and you have to see what are they claiming and why should it be believed. And when you go into and you look at all of the claims of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, you will come to the conclusion, if you really take an honest look at it, that Christianity is false. Or I'm sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> Edit that out. You will come to the conclusion that Islam is false. And Judaism and Christianity are true. How can two religions be true at the same time? It's the law of non-contradiction, right? Which is that uh, two opposing things cannot be correct, uh, true at the same time. Well, Judaism and Christianity don't contradict each other. There's nothing in Judaism that contradicts uh, Christianity. And there's nothing in Christianity that contradicts Judaism. So those two can actually be true at the same time. And as a matter of fact, one of them... Christianity is the fulfillment and really the continuation of the prior Judaism. Um, but Islam is false. And I'm going to get banned on YouTube for saying that, aren't I? Who cares? Islam is false. Because you can look into the claims of Islam and you can ask the question, why should I believe Islam? Why? Well, we have reasons to why we should believe uh, Christianity. Because Jesus Christ was an actual historical person who lived 2,000 years ago. And this historical person performed miracles publicly in front of thousands of people to prove to them that he's God. And then he was executed publicly for it, and then he rose from the dead as well. And he hung out with us for 40 days after he rose from the dead. After all the people had seen him get publicly executed, he rose from the dead, and we saw him there. So um, Christianity is correct. It's true because Jesus Christ really rose from the dead because that's a fact of history. And uh, I dare anybody to try and disprove it. You can't do it. You want to know how I know you can't do it? I tried. And I listen to much smarter people than me who have tried to do it as well. They can't do it either. When you look at all of the data that we have, all of the facts of history, the only logical conclusion that you can arrive to is that this Jesus of Nazareth guy really did rise from the dead and then ascended to heaven. Meaning that he really did and he also performed all of these miracles. That's how his following got so big. <clears throat> The only conclusion that you can come to is that Jesus Christ really was who he claimed to be, and that is God in the flesh, the Son of God. And if Jesus Christ really is who he claimed to be, Christianity is true. Great question. Great question. Who else has another question? Do you have a question? Anybody else? Go ahead, my friend. Go ahead. Um, so my friends get triggered about this question. Mm -hmm. they okay, say, let's see. Everyone. Everyone? All right, everyone. go ahead. Every, hey, they hate me for this. Yeah. Is Harry Potter satanic? Is Harry Potter satanic? So this is a huge, huge, like, controversy. It's massive. like... <clears throat> huge, massive controversy, right? So I've never really read... I've never read the Harry Potter books, and I've never... I, I think I only watched, like, the first three movies, and then when it became clear that they weren't going to stop and they were going to keep coming out, I was like, I quit. I can't keep up with this. It was, it's too much. So there are people that claim that Harry Potter is uh, satanic, right? And the reason that they claim this is because Harry Potter is about like wizards and witchcraft and things uh, of the occult. What I would say is that there are satanic elements in Harry Potter, but what a lot of people, it's kind of like the thing that like you have to take into account. Uh, the author of the Harry Potter books actually has a, has a Christian upbringing. Um, I think she was Anglican, or maybe she was actually Catholic, and she actually was she Anglican. She's Anglican. She had she was raised Anglican. And she actually based the story of Harry Potter off of uh, what she learned growing up as a Christian. And Harry, she, she modeled Harry after Jesus. Um, Harry is like the savior that, you know, and again, I don't know how it ends, but does he die? Does Harry die? And in the, he dies and then comes back. He, he dies and then he comes back. So there, she took Christian elements of it to make her story. Um, there are people that will say that uh, Harry Potter is satanic is there anything in harry potter that explicitly says that we are to follow satan or that we are to follow would you say and you guys will know better than me because i've never really read it i've never really paid much attention to the movies does harry potter present good versus evil yeah. and is harry harry potter is he on the side of good and like objectively good like is he like the good guy yeah. like harry potter wasn't like stabbing babies and then and, and he's like the hero in the movie he was like actually like he was actually like, uh, his character in the movie, the, the character of Harry Potter, is he a character that um, actually affirms like objective, like, uh, objective good? 
if it's objective good and it's not anything that Harry Potter isn't saying, hail Satan, then I wouldn't call it satanic. However, because it is about like, you know, because we know that witchcraft is true. We know that, you know, um, the occult, we know that, it, that it's true. So it can be, you could say that Harry Potter is imprudent to read or to let kids, you could say that it's maybe not the best thing to have kids read because they can get these ideas in their head. However, if you can uh, uh, get moral truths that are correct from Harry Potter, then it's not all bad. But I would just tell people, uh, instead of reading Harry Potter, read C.S. Lewis and read his Lord writings. You know, huh? Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. There you go. Read Lord of the Rings. Because Lord of the Rings present Christian truth in a way that isn't, that doesn't have all of this like occult stuff around it. It's mythical. Um, so yeah, read Lord of the Rings, read the writings of C.S. Lewis, read things that are, that are mythical, that aren't, uh, they don't incorporate things that you want to stay away from. But I probably, if I, I probably wouldn't call Harry Potter satanic, because sat Satanism is something that promotes evil, right? Does Harry Potter promote evil? But Satan Would you say? Um, doesn't promote good, but he uses good to disguise his things. That is true. That is actually correct. Satan, all right, 2 Corinthians tells us that Satan can appear to us like as an angel of light, as if he's good, and cause us, uh, lead us to bad. So it's true. So what I would say is that you have to be just prudent. Again, I can't really give a definitive answer on this because I've never, I've never read the books and I've never really... When I watched the movies, I was like in elementary school. Um, and I'm an old man now. But um, that's something that you guys would have to like, you know, should I be watching this or not? You have to use your own judgment with that. So I'm not triggered, bro. I'm cool. I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Does anybody else have any other questions? Um, also one more. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Is Halloween satanic? <laughs> no. Actually, I talked about this, I think, before you got here, because you guys came in late. So uh, Halloween means a uh, holy oh, eve, yeah. holy evening. Before and it's All Saints Day. Before All Saints Day. So uh, Halloween is actually a Christian holiday. Well, what I mean, holiday. culturally now. You mean like culturally now? Yeah. Um, it depends on what it is that you're celebrating. Like, if you use Halloween as an occasion to celebrate evil, yeah, then don't celebrate Halloween if you use it to celebrate evil. Um, Halloween, what it's for is to pray for the souls of the faithful departed the night before All Saints Day, so that when you go and you venerate all of the saints in heaven, you know, the people that you prayed for, they be in heaven, you're venerating them as well, and you prayed for them the night before, which is appropriate to do. But secular Halloween, you know where secular Halloween came from? In Mexico... They have the tradition that on, on, uh, on, on Halloween, you go, to, you go to graveyards and you pray at graveyards for, the, for your loved ones that have passed away. And people, when they would go to graveyards and pray for them, um, they would actually like dress up as like the people that they were praying for. They would like put on the clothes of, of the people that have passed away to honor their memory. So they would go dressed in their clothes, like in the costumes, and they would pray. And then America, because Halloween only really exists in America, um, America saw that tradition that like the Mexicans were doing and they're like that's pretty cool cemeteries are spooky so Halloween is a spooky holiday oh and they dress up in like costumes so that's why we have the costumes and um, it's just to make money like we can sell costumes we can sell Halloween decorations to make every house on every block spooky and then oh we can sell a whole bunch of candy because one of the things that Mexicans would do too as well is that the day on, no on November 1st they would eat a whole bunch of candy. And if you want anything about that Mexican candy, you can't put it down. So they're like, let's sell candy too. So it's like a secularized version of the Christian holiday. Um, there's nothing objectively wrong with dressing up in a fun costume and then going like a around your neighborhood and a trusted neighborhood of people that you know and getting candy. That's actually fun. Kids enjoy that and it's, it's, good. Uh, it's good because it can build communities. Like you go around house to house and you can see your neighbors, talk to your neighbors, and it, it, it's super important to build community. And if uh, Halloween is an occasion for you to do that, that's fine. Just make sure. And I actually I have a recent video. Is it up yet on the on my on the TikTok and Instagram about Halloween? Not yet. Not yet. Tomorrow. Or tomorrow? Okay. Um, if you're gonna be dressed dressed up, don't dress up like a, a stripper, okay? Because a lot of girls dress up as strippers. Or they dress up like in, in, in costumes that are like really way too, don't do that. Be, be modest, be modest. Um, and don't dress up as like something stupid. Don't dress up as something offensive, something that's sacrilegious. Don't, if you're going to dress up, dress up as something fun, something cool, something funny. Nothing disrespectful or sacrilegious or rude or immodest. 
you know. And uh, when you go trick-or-treating, go in the neighborhood that you know, people that you know, and that's a good way to build up the community. So it all depends on how you celebrate it. But if you spend Halloween trying to uh, play with the Ouija board and uh, conjure up spirits and doing stuff, you messed up, you done goofed, don't do it. Halloween isn't for you. If you think that's what Halloween is, you done goofed and you're, you're a sucker. So no, don't, don't do that on Halloween, okay? Any other questions, guys? Do you have any other questions? Or can we, my man Aaron? Any other? Go ahead, my man. We're, I feel like we might be wrapping up. I don't know. If most, some of you guys don't have any more questions, but this might be the last one. Go ahead, Aaron. And if you guys have more questions, feel free. I can stay here all night if you want me to. This will be the last one. This will be the last one? Okay. Um, so I recently debated a Seventh day Adventist. Uh huh. And they were claiming that we changed the Sabbath day. That we changed the Sabbath day? Yeah, because of mm -hmm. Exodus 20. Mm -hmm. You know where it goes. <laughs> I want right. to explain that to everyone. So Seventh Day Adventists claim that we change the Sabbath day. What is the Sabbath day? What is what is the day? Saturday. Saturday. Do Christians claim that Sunday is Saturday? <laughs> Do we claim that it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday? Is that what we claim? Is that what we do we remove Saturday from the calendar? Is we only have a six six day week? No, we we didn't we didn't change the Sabbath day. The commandments say that you observe the Lord's day, right? So the Lord's day is what you observe, right? And uh, in the Old Covenant, the Lord's day was observed on uh, the last day of the week, which is Saturday, which is where the word Sabbath comes from, Sabado, right? It, it, Saturday means Sabbath. So you observe the last day of the week, right? In the New Covenant, the Lord's day is now observed on the first day of the week, which is also the eighth day. So on the seventh day, uh, you rest, right? But on the eighth day, and, and here's the thing, uh, what, you know, the way that the Sabbath was observed, right? In the Old Covenant, is that's the day of rest. Well, Sunday, is, you can't even say that that's, that's not the day of rest. Sa because what does the word liturgy mean? Sunday are the days that we go to liturgy, right? What does the word liturgy mean? Holy work. Holy work. So on Sunday, you're not resting, you're doing holy work. And what is the holy work that you're doing on Sunday? You're worshiping God. So Sunday isn't a day of rest. We're not claiming that Sunday is the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath. That's what Sabbath means. It means Saturday. That's the day of rest. Sunday is the day of holy work. Sunday is the day of liturgy. It's the day that you worship God. So no, um, we didn't change the Sabbath. Saturday is still on our calendar. You can still rest on Saturday. That, that's why we usually, you know, even in the, in, the, in the secular world, we have the weekends off because we have Saturday, the last day of the week, we have it off. And we have Sunday, the first day of the week, we have it off, right? That's part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. But Sunday is the Lord's day because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And that is the appropriate day to worship God. Because remember that we're in the new covenant and uh, Jesus brings forth the new creation. So um, there's only seven days in, a, in the week, right? But Sunday is, it's not only is it the first day, it's technically the eighth day, right? So the eighth day, the number eight, especially in the ancient world, uh, all numbers had significance to them. The number eight is the number for infinity. That's why the symbol for infinity is a figure eight, right? Uh, it means infinity. It means new creation. It means, uh, the, it means heaven. That's what eight means, right? Seven is a uh, natural, uh, uh, the number for um, perfect things in nature. Eight is the number for things, the, super, the perfect things of the supernatural order. So it's appropriate to worship God, do the work, holy work, on the eighth day, which is the first day. And it's appropriate that it's the first day because it's the new creation. So creation is started over with the new covenant. And that's the day that we worship God. So let the Sabbath be the Sabbath and let the Lord's day be be the Lord's Day. So that's it. They're not, they don't compete. The Lord's Day is just now observed on a more appropriate day because we're in the New Covenant. In the same way that we now have baptism and baptism replaces circumcision. So if they want to say, oh, you're supposed to uh, observe the Sabbath, say, okay, are you supposed to be circumcised as a matter of principle? Because that's also part of the law of Moses. No. We have a new circumcision, which is baptism, which the Bible teaches in Colossians chapter 2. Is that good? So was that the last question? Are you guys all good? Are you guys all 
Tired of hearing the voice of reason? <laughs> thank you guys so much. This was a blast. I really have, thank you guys. Thank you. A round of applause for yourselves as you guys asked me fantastic questions. Thank you. I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed. And if anybody wants to fight me after this, I'll be in the parking lot when we, <laughs> if anybody wants to fight, okay? God bless you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>